It's a monumental decision that uh, affects us every day. It does, and, and I, I go swimming too, and I, I know I can go out to a certain spot, and this is public property, and my friends and I can, can use it. And for our kids, we want them to be the best at whatever they choose to be, and be honest, contributing citizens to our community, to come back, to give back, and just to do what's right in life. Do what's right, even when no one's watching. The game business is bigger than the movie business. Sometimes I, I see young people and they go, I want to be a game designer, I want to get into the game business. To get into the game business today, you, have to, you can't just be good, you have to be brilliant. How can you spot a truly creative mind, an innovator and problem solver? Do they share similar personality traits? Are they smarter than the rest of us? More confident, more daring? Well, coming up on Long Story Short, three very different people, all practitioners of original thinking. One-on-one, -on -one, engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Original thinkers reveal themselves as they assume a variety of roles within our community. What is that special motivation or skill that inspired a chief justice, a public school teacher, and a video game creator turned philanthropist? All three trusted their instincts, their sense of priority and free thinking. Well, first, we'll turn to a 2009 conversation with a man known as CJ, a nickname given to the late Hawaii State Supreme Court Chief Justice William S. Richardson. He was a public school graduate who grew up in a working-class Kaimuki family during the 1920s. He championed Hawaii's Democratic Party during its rise to power in the 50s and served as Lieutenant Governor during the John Burns administration. He was the state's chief justice during some of the most formative years in Hawaii's history, when a young island state searched for its sense of identity and fundamental values. You were one of the people that was uh, excited about statehood, that helped to make it happen, that uh, recrafted government in the wake of statehood. Uh, and now we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of statehood, 2009. Many Hawaiians don't see that as cause for celebration. Well, to me, it's great cause for celebration. And we're part of a great country. Like every other state in the Union, they had to come up and live and have their new laws jibe with the old. Even if you go back to England, where the common law came over, and, and if you looked at the way the law went across the country, right through the Louisiana Purchase, where the French came in, and they, we had to, the country had to adjust to that. And now we must still look at how it affects the Far East and all the other uh, countries and states and islands throughout the Pacific Ocean. Part of what is now is based on the great Mahele, King Kamehameha III, um, and that was considered a distribution, it was a distribution of land. Do you think that was uh, well, I, Pono? I think it's Pono. I think our, uh, our leaders of the past were as good as any in, that ever existed that our, our Hawaiian ways were just way, ways of living. Uh, and Hawaii should revive what we could of the good parts. And I would say almost all of it were good parts. You could have used um, the English law as a precedent, but often you would look back at, to see what um, Ali'i from the monarchy days did. Well, whenever I could, uh, whatever the history books would come up with on, on old Hawaii and what few things that I had picked up over the years, uh, I felt that I should try to apply those to the extent that, that uh, we could. For example, when the question came, well, who owns 
the new land being created by lava from the volcano, what was the answer of your court? Well, that seemed easy enough for me, but uh, uh, I know the, the beaches were needed in Hawaii. Without our beaches, there was no Hawaii to speak of, the Hawaii that we loved. Now, in many parts of the continent, the, the beaches are private property, right? Yes, it seemed perfectly logical to me that, that people should be able to use the beaches and, and that uh, the property lines could not follow all of the methods of, of old England, say, and that I should try to bring those cases up in line to the way the Hawaiians did it. And that wasn't the only big one you did. Uh, there were the rights of citizens to challenge land court decisions, uh, Native Hawaiian rights, and, and use of private property. Well, Water? again, I, I wasn't that much of an expert in, on, uh, on Hawaiian law, but I had a good court. And they were willing and able to go in and look at all of the, the problems and see what was going on. And I, I traveled around the islands a lot. And uh, you're, you're, you're speaking now of, perhaps of, of water rights, which was so important because we were a plantation community. And you, you get to a case like when two plantations uh, began to argue over, the, over how much water they could have, they both needed water. But when a third one began to take too much water to the detriment of some of the others, then, then you had to decide whose water should, should it be. The Robinson case, in the end, was clear to me, but uh, it seemed revolutionary, I suppose. But the people who really needed the water were those in the bottom of the, of the streams, the, the, the taro patch and the rice patch owners. They're the ones that needed the water. And so it seemed simple to me to just say, well, neither of you uh, is entitled to all of that water. It's the people down below, the taro patch owners and the rice patch owners. It's elegantly sim simple, and it's because you, I actually uh, talked with um, the dean of the law school, which is named after you, um, Avi Soifer said, imagine, you know, very complicated filings going on for years, big battle, and you said, well, let's take a look at what's happening at the end of the line. Well, uh, and we were, we were a new state, not not used to following, just being a follower. We, we needed to decide for ourselves what was best for our people. You took some heat over that, but um, it became um, a symbol of enlightenment uh, that people said, you know, here's a far thinking guy using the past to build on the future. Well, of course I'm glad to hear you say that. <laughs> And I, th I thought it was right. There was never any question in my own mind. Chief Justice Richardson, for whom the law school at the University of Hawaii is named, was an original thinker in the right place at the right time, and his legacy is embedded in the constitutional laws of our state. Sometimes the journey that brings the right original thinker to the right place in time is really not much of a journey at all, but no less impactful. In our 2009 conversation with Candy Suiso, she said that when she graduated from Waianae High School, she thought she wanted to get away from the Leeward Coast community and never come back. Thankfully, this second-generation teacher and Milken Award-winning educator had a change of heart. Although she would insist on sharing the credit, today, Suiso's legacy is the National Emmy Award-winning Sea Rider Productions at Waianae High School. It is not only the largest, most successful digital media center at any school in the state, it's the driving force behind a movement to improve a challenged community from within.
I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to give back to a community that was very good to me. Uh, I really felt that that's where um, I was the most needed. It felt right. I wanted to be in, I wanted to be home. I wanted to be in a community that raised me. And it was the right thing to do. I just felt that that was the right thing to do. And I, I, it was the right decision when I look back. Much of what you've done at YNI High School wasn't done um, really within the system. You had to find ways to equip yourself and your students with grants. You had to become a, a grant writer. To, to get the proper equipment, the space. Mm -hmm. There's, within the DOE, there's so many limitations and there's only so much money to go around and part of our success is I believe we've learned to work around the system and been very successful in going up, like you said, going after a lot of grants, a lot of support, pulling together partners, pulling together people that believe in you. That's been our success. Um, we had to prove ourselves, you know, like you said, the right people at the right time started to notice these students and started to give. Because they were doing things with nothing. When we first started, we started in a classroom with no air conditioning, with very little equipment. And by the way, so heat isn't just bad for people, That's it's bad so for bad. equipment. We would pack 50 kids, 40 kids in a classroom and it was hot and no air conditioning, but you know, those kids never grumbled. They never grumbled because they didn't have an air conditioned room or top of the line equipment like a lot of other schools did. Instead, they just started to create projects and they did some pretty good projects and people started to notice. That's what happened is people started to notice. How do they know they could do that? How, what got them started? You just, just you give them the tools. You, as, as educators, you know, or the team of educators, there was enough people out there that said, you can do it, of course you can do it. You make a video here, here's the, here's the tool, here's the camera, here's the tool, here's how you do it. The essence of video production, as I look at it, is storytelling. What, uh, what kind of experience do you think your students had in storytelling? They are born with a gift to tell a story. I really believe their success is because they, were, they are born with the gift to create. They, they're, they, they're, they are most, I, the kids out in Waianae, I really believe are the most creative, loving storytellers um, because they're they grow up, they don't grow up with a lot. I really believe it, they don't grow up with a lot. So they entertain themselves by um, playing the ukulele, t sitting around talking story. They draw, they doodle, they sing. And it carries over, when they come to us, they just, they're so strong and th their heartfelt creativity carries over with this tool. All of a sudden we have these expensive toys now that we give them and we say, go create. And, they, and they just take to it. It is amazing. Now, it's you didn't incredible. have the star pupils of YNI High School. Some of your kids were doing really poorly in other classes. Mm -hmm. They were, they were showing up. They were reporting to school from their homes on the beach in tents. Mm -hmm. We have the homeless. We have, we have kids who, parents have been in jail. They are abused. They come to us. We know there were, a lot of dysfunction, uh, so much. And I understand. You know, that's my world. I grew up there, and I. I know that world and they come to us and we give them hope. It's For a lot of these kids, it's their security, we're their family. Uh, we, give, we, we teach them a tool and they become successful at it. And it's, they, they see something that they create and it, for their self-esteem, it's wow, I did that. You know, they, they, it's, it, it gives them hope and they, they realize I have just learned something that I can do for life. And it turns, a lot of these kids' lives have been turned around. They've, they would have dropped out, I really believe, if they, and they'll tell us that too. If it wasn't for this class, I would have dropped out, or I didn't know I was going to go to college, or I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And now so many of our kids are college graduates. They're being recruited They're by being recruited. television stations and, and advertising yes, agencies. Yes, yes, yes. I remember when your Sea Riders first started doing public service announcements for various clients. You, you invited the business community to, to hire the kids and said, we'll see what we can come up with for you. And I just remember as a professional television person at that time, 
how the student's work had so much more depth than what you would normally see in a PSA or public service announcement because the kids knew that world, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. they, when it was about crystal meth, yes. they brought a reality to it that yes. nobody had brought before. These kids know what it's like to live in houses, in homes where there's crystal meth, where they have to be in a car where someone's been drinking. They know how it hurts. They know how it hurts. And it's, it, was, it was their stories. If you look at any of those PSAs, those are their stories. They knew that was either them or that was someone that they knew and they were able to come up with the idea from the heart, from real life. And I think that's what makes their, their work so powerful. It's, it's real stories. They tell their stories, whether it's a news story, a public service announcement, a commercial, it's, they're just telling their story. Tell me about If Can Can. If Can Can, if No Can No Can, because you know, there's nothing worse, we feel, than saying you're going to do something and not do it and not follow through. And we tell these kids, if you're going to do something, if you're going to say you're going to do something, hold yourself to it and, and do it. Follow through and do it. Because really, there's nothing worse than not completing something that you've committed to. And if we could teach them now in school, it will carry over in life, in a job, in a marriage, in a relationship. And when you work in teams, you know other people are counting on you. Yes, because it's teamwork. And the good thing about our program is every, every project that these kids do is a team effort. And we always think, if you have, when you leave our program, if you have learned nothing about video production, about creating a web page, about a page layout, a newspaper, we hope you've really learned the importance of teamwork, cooperation. And getting things done on time? Ex meeting deadlines, respect, respect for self, respect for other people, respect for property. So if you're going to say you're going to do something, you better do it because if you don't, you're dropping the ball for your teammates. But just don't say you're going to do something if you can't do it because you let everybody down. So if can, can, if no can, no can, and it's been our mantra and the kids, they get it, the kids get it. Where do you think this movement will take the Waianae Coast? I hope eventually it will take them out of poverty. It might take decades, but this is certainly a start. You have a group of young adults that are really making a difference because they have come back to the Waianae Coast and they are giving back and they believe in themselves and they're believing in the students that are under them and they're trying very hard to prove to the rest of the world that we're just as good as everybody else if you just give us a chance. Perhaps educator Candy Suiso would have provided inspiration for our next original thinker who nearly dropped out of high school. In 2016, visionary entrepreneur Hank Rogers told us that he took the one and only elective course offered at Stuyvesant High School in New York City. When he learned everything there was to know about that elective in computer science, he saw no reason to remain in school. But he did graduate from high school, and Hank Rogers has made a fortune in the video gaming industry, most notably for bringing Tetris, one of the world's top-selling video games, from Russia to the rest of the world. More recently, this Hawaii resident and visionary entrepreneur has turned his talents to no less than saving the planet. He made that leap when suddenly confronted with just how fragile his own life could be. I found myself in the back of an ambulance with 100% blockage of the Widowmaker. That is the artery, the biggest artery in your heart, and it will kill you if it's blocked. And so I was lucky because I, I kind of felt it coming and uh, we called an, they called an ambulance for me. And so I was already on the way to, to, the, to Straub. Uh, and then I realized, because they were going to take me in for observation. They said, there's nothing really wrong with you. We'll just take you in for the observation. We won't even turn on the siren. The siren went on. The guy who was taking care of him was, was in the cockpit talking to the hospital and saying, get the opera. I didn't hear, but I knew he was saying, this guy is not even going to make it. Get the operation room ready and operating room ready, blah, blah, blah. I'm back there saying, first, I said, you got to be kidding me. I haven't spent any of the money yet. You know, it's, and I was kind of like, is this some kind of a joke? I worked so hard all my life and finally sell my company, get a bunch of money, and uh, I'm on the way out. And then the second thing I said, no, I'm not going. I still have stuff to do. And it's kind of like I thought, you know, what are the things that I, that I always talked to myself that I was going to get done in life and that I hadn't, hadn't even started? 
And that just made me say, no, I'm going to do this. And so I was in the, in the hospital recovering, and the next couple of weeks I didn't go back to work. I had my chance to think about my bucket list. And uh, so these are my missions in life. And uh, the first mission came to me in the back of the newspaper. It was like, in the back of the newspaper it said a story about coral. Oh, by the way, we're going to kill all the coral in the world by the end of the century. And you know, I moved to Hawaii and I fell in love with the ocean. I, I used to dive surf at, in, uh, on the North Shore and I couldn't believe that we would do something so callous as to kill all the coral in the world. Islands are made out of coral. And you know, you look in a little bit further and it's like a third of the life in the ocean is dependent on the coral existing. So I said, no, no, we're not allowed to do that. What's causing that? It's ocean acidification. What's causing that? Carbon dioxide going into the ocean is causing that. So then my first mission is to end the use of carbon-based fuel. And so I started the foundation and recently we had a big success in Hawaii that Hawaii has, uh, has made the mandate that they were gonna be 100% renewable by 2045. Uh, for electricity, and that is a huge step in the right direction. And your Blue Planet Foundation had a had a role. Oh, we 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 I would say we're the ones who created that legislation and fought for it. And you know, because when you you create a piece of legislation, then you have to work with all the politicians, and you got to get enough politicians to get behind it to get it passed. And so it's not it's not good enough to just come up with the words because. It's, it's all the pushing that goes on. That's, I guess it's called lobbying. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and you're already off the grid uh, at your home in Honolulu and on the ranch. Yes, so we, we were studying storage and <clears throat> we finally decided that we were gonna just get off the grid on, uh, on the big island. And so we tested the different storage technologies and now we ended up with uh, a, a battery technology that basically runs by itself. What are some of the things that prepared you to have the career you did, which was something you, you made up yourself, there, you didn't follow a template for it. What were some of the formative things along the way? Um, I think, I think uh, one of the things that is that I, I always felt that, I always had a deep-rooted feeling that I, whatever it is that I wanted to do, I could do it. Where did that come from? I think, I think it came from New York. It's, it's kind of an attitude that we had in high school. We stopped the war in Vietnam. Uh, okay, we didn't specifically, but we were part of it. And uh, that kind of energy, the, the feeling that youth can change the world, and, uh, and that is a very in important feeling. And uh, I need the young people in Hawaii to have that feeling to, to, they need to take ownership of their future and make Hawaii the example of sustainability. This video game creator, environmentalist, the public school teacher, and the chief justice, three original thinkers. What they seem to share is an unwavering persistence to push, to get it right, and have confidence in the choices they make. We're honored to revisit our conversation with the late Chief Justice William Richardson, and we thank Candy Suiso and Hank Rogers for their inspiring stories. I'm Leslie Wilcox for Long Story Short. Mahalo to you for joining us. Aloha nui. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. Were you ambitious? Not that I know of. But, uh, but you went ahead and went through four years I, I, at UH. I went four years at UH and enjoyed it all the way through. Met a lot of uh, people who would later be your allies in politics and yes, good yes. friends in good uh, friends. Long life. Uh, they helped me in everything I had done. You went to UH and yes. you had more than most people of your time had a college degree, but that wasn't going to be the end of your higher education. Well, I thought it was, but uh, I, I had a job with, with the oil company, and I thought, well, this would be great. I, I like this kind of work. I, I think I'll do this the rest of my life. And then one of the professors up at school went to see my father, and she said, now this boy better go on to, to law school. And I said, well, how, how can you do that, Dad? You can't afford it. Well, he said, you know, if you if you really gonna go, uh, I'll rent your room out, and you go on to college, which he did. 
In those days, it was five days by steamship and another four days by train to get to the East Coast. And your mom was a legendary teacher on the Waianae Coast, right? Oh, she, 31 years of her life, she dedicated her life to, to teaching out there. And really, that was her life. She impacted a, a community in 30 years, just taught at Macaw Elementary School. She went there and she never left. I remember the principal would always throw all of these hardcore kids and say, okay, Mrs. Smith, you're the one that's gonna take these kids. And she would turn them around. She would just, she, she was mean, but she was very strict and she was very fair and she loved them all and she did. She turned a lot of lives around. When I started my company, um, I used my, my Hawaii experience of, of ARG, which is uh, we pl playing Dungeons and Dragons and uh, personal computers happened and I, I thought this is my chance and I, um, so I made the first role playing game in Japan. But I didn't speak, read or write Japanese and I hacked that computer and got my wife to try to read something in the manual but she knows nothing about computers and so that was also like a hocus pocus that was coming out of the manual. Anyway, uh, I hacked my way through the game, made it. So there were no role playing games before the Black Onyx and it became the number one game in 1984, and it was the number two game in 1985, so it had a two-year reign. Uh, and now, like something like 30% of all games in Japan are role-playing games. So I could, you know, people that are in the industry that meet me and find out that I wrote Black Onyx is, oh my God, you're the reason I'm in this industry. You know? <laughs>